Thank you. Uh, as Rob said, I'm the co-founder of Kickoff Labs. Uh, we do uh, simply amazing landing pages, whether it's uh, for running a contest, lead generation, or um, launching a product. I'll try not to talk too much about that today, um, but it is part of our journey uh, to 989 uh, paying customers, um, which is what I'm going to chat about with you. Um, didn't start with 989 customers. Um, we founded, we started Kickoff Labs in February of 2011. Uh, it took us a few months to get our MVP out that we were going to charge people for. We launched uh, in June of that year. And a month later, um, you know, we were rolling into dough. We, uh, we raked in 10 whole dollars in the first month. It was awesome. I uh, contacted Scott. He's in New Jersey. I'm in Seattle. We do all sorts of things startups aren't supposed to do um, <laughs> over Skype. And I said, what are you going to do with your $5? I'm just forgetting about expenses. This was $5 profit. And uh, his answer was, uh, hookers and coke. What are you going to do with yours? And I said, I know you live in New Jersey, but you're going to have to lower your standards, or we're going to have to figure out how to sell our software. Um, <laughs> ironically, we were building software for marketing purposes to have landing pages to help people with their launches. And uh, we failed to uh, take advantage of ours. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of backdrop. Since then, uh, we've had well over 1,000 uh, 1, paying subscribers to the, to the software. Um, so still kind of still very small, and we're here to learn primarily, which is why. Um, but figured we could give back a little bit while we're here. Um, I think the most important customer is uh, is you. Uh, and so when you start thinking about you know how many customer, or how who my customers are going to be, you have to think about yourself first. And uh, and uh, Sherry's talk was was really valuable uh, to hear because it, it rang true. Um, I had before we uh, started Kickoff Labs. I have what a lot of people, what my mom would have described as a uh, as a great job. I uh, ran a software team at a cool company that did social software, and uh, and on paper it, it looked great. Um, but the last couple of years I was there, they shifted and they started um, focusing more on the the Fortune 500 customers as opposed to medium, uh, smaller, medium sized businesses, and. That just led to the, the shift in customers and who we were working with, even on the, the product team, just changed our strategy, how we, had to, how we had to talk to them, how we planned our products. And I got really tired of the 12-member, cross-divisional, cross-country uh, you know, planning committees that were now dictating my life. And these people couldn't decide whether a reply button needed to be on the left side of a post or the right side of a post. And they didn't care about the data that proved one way or the other. Uh, they just wanted to sit in a room and argue because they got paid for it. And so it, that led me to come home and, and take these arguments out on you know, my, my family and kick the dog. And uh, I didn't kick the dog that much. But, uh, <laughs> but I was talking to my wife one day about one of these stupid arguments. It was probably the reply button. Um, and I didn't think I was talking that loud. And we'd had our first son. Uh, he was nine months old at the time. And we were at the dinner table. And, um, and he started crying. And I realized he's small, but I realized it was because the way I was talking about my day, I wasn't even that mad about it. I kind of thought it was a funny story, but I must have been a little agitated. It was turning me into a bad person. It was turning me into someone I didn't like. And so I had to find a new set of customers. And the company that I was working for was not going to give me those customers. They decided to go onward and upward. And, um, and that's great. They'll, they'll, they've had and will continue to have a lot of success doing that, I'm sure. But that's why you have to be selfish, because as a founder, you get to choose who your customers are and what challenges you put in front of yourself. So focus on that first. Uh, lots of people have said it. I don't want to go too much detail, but um, getting two th customers 2 through 20 go outside after, after we launched. You know, we're both technical person. I said, maybe I should go start talking to customers. should have done that before, he <laughs> said. But, um, but that, was, uh, that was extremely valuable to start, uh, start getting. Stay away from, uh, from personal friends, acquaintances, even just casual conversations. Like you know, I hear a lot of people ha hearing here, uh, having here pitching ideas. That's great, but you're not going to get the real feedback, like people have said, unless you say, so give me a check. Right? And, and then you'll find out what people, what people really think. One thing that worked really well for us, even though we are bootstrapped, um, is I really got a lot of good feedback going and talking to investors. And not that I really wanted the investment, because I wanted to bootstrap the company. Um, but they're used to telling you what they really think, uh, for the most part. And the good investors will just flat out say, here's the 10 things wrong with your business. And you know, eight of those 10 things are probably right on. And you'll, you'll, you'll learn that. Um, and so talking to investors is really helpful for us uh, in this space. Customers 21 through 100, um, we started thinking, 
oh, we should scale up our blog, we should start tweeting, we should start Facebooking. Uh, I like to test everything. So we know we did all this at ad nauseum. Uh, and this is a fail, and it's a fail because at two through 100 people we've contacted, you don't have an audience. You're, you're nobody, I'm a nobody, you know, unless, even if you're a celebrity, as Jason said earlier, it, that doesn't help you. Um, and you know, I think a blog is great for long-term content marketing plays, but it's not gonna satisfy that itch to start getting profit and revenue um, as quickly as you want it. Uh, so what you wanna do is start finding out uh, where your customers are hanging out, where are the places online and offline that you can actually meet and talk with, uh, meet and talk with these people and get them to sign up uh, for your product. Um, for us, that had to do with finding a lot more of a niche startup and marketing communities. Uh, Quora uh, is, I think, a, a great resource, just as one specific tip that worked for us. Um, 10 hours worth of Quora postings um, for, uh, uh, on, on my account uh, have generated over $35,000 worth of sales for us um, in, in the last year and a half, uh, 10 hours. Um, so how did I do that in 10 hours? Uh, I looked for pe questions people were asking about landing pages, about launching products, about you know, running a startup, and I added my two cents. And my byline has a link to our product. And um, the other thing that people do is they, all the time, they ask for, hey, I'm looking for a service that does, uh, that does invoicing. What are the best invoicing services? Your answer should be there. There's no shame in being from your company and saying, hey, you can preface it. I'm from this company. This is what we do. Here's why we're good. Add an image. Make it look better than some of the other answers that people see. It's a social directory. And there's other versions of this community. For us, it happened to be Cora, inbound.org, places like that where marketing professionals hang out. Uh, for you, it might be a different, uh, a different niche community. Uh, point being, it's not your Facebook friends, it's not the people on Twitter, it's a specific location. And within each location, there's ways you can optimize your success um, by, you know, in our case, it was looking for what people were asking, uh, you know, looking for what people were asking, answering questions, and then Quora has a nifty promotion system where you can promote your answers because you've earned some karma and you can spend your karma there. Um, it was free money, um, essentially. Another big thing was uh, was, having, was thinking about, you know, customers also bought. Most of you are not in the business of building a complete end-to-end -end Microsoft Office solution that's going to solve everybody's uh, office needs. We're, we're in the business of, you know, we solve this problem really well, um, but a customer also has this problem, this problem, this problem. And if you think about your customer profile and your customer persona, what are the other tools they were using? Uh, for us, people were using tools like, uh, like, like, uh, like user voice for customer support, like Kiss Metrics uh, for analytics, and so we reached out to those companies. Said, "Hey, you know, could we do a guest blog post on your blog? You know, we'll trade audiences back and forth, um, and trading audiences with related products, and getting mentions in newsletters, talking to the, the other founders, figuring out where their customers were in has been a big help for us. So if you imagine that Amazon thing of what customers have also bought, uh, it's extremely important to to think about." People don't talk about this much, um, stealing customers. Uh, the slide is intentionally uh, a little bit uh, obtuse. Uh, but the point being, um, <laughs> the point being customers, they look for you know, solutions, alternatives to a problem. Um, and if your name isn't coming up to alternative to competitor, why not? If you search for, uh, for Grasshopper alternative, and Grasshopper's a voice, uh, voice uh, 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 e-voice company, um, and, and you search for that on Google, you're gonna find some of their competitors own that space, um, or you know, Grasshopper Alternative. Um, you should at least know, you know, what, you know what you are, how you're different, how your competitors are different than you, because your customers are gonna ask. They've asked us, I'm sure they've asked anybody who's had a, had a product. Um, and the other thing we did was, um, I had no shame about you know, if I saw somebody talk pro or con about a, co a company that I thought was a, was a, was a com competitor to us on Twitter or on Facebook, I just chat them up and say, hey, you know, why do you like that feature so much? What does it do for you? Um, they're doing it in public. There's no reason you can't be personal and, and, be, and go in public. And I'm not trying to say, switch over to using my service. I want to learn from them. And sometimes they do switch, and that's nice. Um, but I want to learn like, why they're choosing this service, how they found it, what they came from. Because I can only learn so much from the people that have found our service just starting out as a new business. Um, and we, we personally emailed a lot of people that were using, uh, that were using the competition that we could find, and, and it was uh, incredibly valuable to find out what our weaknesses were and what our competitors' strengths were just by talking to their customers. I, 
I could I could lead with this uh, and say love your customers for 101 to uh, to 500, um, but it's way too easy to love that one customer you get every week uh, because I, I sure I sure as heck hope you're you get one customer a week that you're talking to them directly, you're solving their problems, that they have your product. It gets harder when you start having when you start having you know in the triple digits of customers uh, coming through trying the product per week, and I'm sure it gets even harder at the scales we've heard today of you know several thousand uh, customers coming through a week, and and it's just amazing to me the low bar that most of the competition, especially bigger uh, companies, set for support. I felt bad one day. I, I emailed uh, a customer back, and it had been like 26 hours since they emailed the support line. Uh, and I, I said, I apologize for the delayed response. And, and his answer was, delayed response? I emailed your competitors, and they didn't get back to me for a week. You know, you guys are killing it. And I was like, that is such a low, sad, sad bar. Uh, <laughs> um, and so it's easy to do, especially when you're small. And if you have a choice between emailing and helping a customer or going back and behind the computer screen and adding a feature, by all means, choose the customer because you're going to learn so much more from that uh, from that back and forth while you can do it while you're still the one answering those emails than you will from going and coding up a new feature. Which leads, leads me into getting personal. Uh, I literally did uh, email every single one of the first 500 people that signed up for our service and went through the process of creating a landing page. Um, it wasn't an automated mail. It wasn't an account mail. I looked at the page they created. I looked at the title they put in. I looked at the logo. I looked at the company they were they were promoting, and I emailed them some personalized tips. And I said, "Hey, what if you changed the tag tagline to this? What if you uh, added this as an as an image? That would probably help your conversions on the page." Um, because I just wanted to get to know them. I wanted to get to know who they were, who, why they wanted to use our service, and then find out. Hey, you know, I'd, after they'd answer and say thanks, I'd follow up and say, you know, how come you didn't click the buy button? Once you establish that relationship, and it can be really quick, they'll tell you and say, well, I didn't click the buy button because you don't have this. And you start to hear that as a pattern, and you say, that should prioritize. That could prioritize what we do next. Um, I just have this just. If any of you have a service, um, do not ever send a no reply email. It's just my personal plea to everybody. Why are you making it harder for people to get in touch with you that want to get in touch with you? Just don't do it. Um, so much of this comes down to, to over delivering um, because I think, uh, I think it's especially important in the beginning that you have to do things that didn't scale. I guarantee we lost lots of money on the first uh, 100, 200, 300 customers if you counted the time it took Scott and I to work through some of the issues that they had. Um, but I don't think we'd be where we were today if we hadn't gone through that process of setting the bar of we're going to over deliver. Fifth person asked for a feature, even if the first person asked if it was on our roadmap somewhere, we just bump it up and say, we're going to do this next and email them back in two days and say, hey, check, it, check out the site now. And they, they're just blown away. And those people become your evangelists that later on you can hit up for case studies and, and for marketing materials and to help send newsletters and blog posts on your behalf and to do some of that trading I talked about earlier. But establishing those relationships is, is so critical around that it's worth uh, over-delivering to, to that first uh, and every set of customers, really. But especially when you're, uh, when, when you're starting out small, um, it's way, way more important, as I said earlier, than, than adding another feature. Being social, uh, sharing goals. Um, we have a silly thing. People like to feel like they're part of something. There's a lot of studies behind it. I won't get into the research. Um, but so we put a silly bar up on our site that says, uh, help us get to 500, uh, 500 customers. Um, and I, I'm a, it, it dramatically increases the amount that people are willing to share. They click the Twitter button, the Facebook uh, button. And then I'm amazed when people call support and I'll, and I'll talk to them. They'll say, oh, it looks like you're really close now to 20,000 people. I know you're going to hit it next week. Um, and people get bought into it. And I'm amazed how much a little psychological trick of just being honest with, hey, this is our goal. We want to get to 500 customers. If we get to there, we can keep serving you better. Um, and, uh, and we were honest with it and, it. and it works to involve customers in your goals. That's my cute kid picture. Um, I, I have no shame. <clears throat> I think a lot of people try in our space to pretend like you're a huge company. And I, I don't know why. There's, you you want to look professional, but at the same time, um, you can you can lower the bar of expectations people have and make over delivering easier. If you say, "Hey, we're just uh, two guys with kids who we have to feed, and we're doing this business, and if we get to this many customers, it could help." And here's my kid; he wants to eat three times a day. Uh, 
I, I, have, I have no shame. At some point, that won't make sense on our website anymore, um, and we'll, we'll find some other way to, to, to hook into people's feelings, but, um, but, <laughs> but it, it can work. Um, people say, like, you, you want to you wanna stand out, do something a little bit different uh, from other people. Uh, it, it does work. Uh, I had uh, some journalists uh, that I was tweeting back and forth with, and they said, and they were just joking about the return of Pets.com. And so I put up a landing page on our service for Pets.com 2 coming soon and pushed it out there, published it. And, uh, and that got us written up in three different places just because I was willing to go out there and do something a little bit crazy to, to market uh, what we were doing. Um, by this point, 500 and 99, you've got some success stories, hopefully. Spend your time amplifying what they say. Take, collect a document with any quotes they give you that you can reuse and start reusing them in emails and newsletters. And say, case studies, quotes, good karma can earn you a lot. Um, when you start building trust with customers, uh, you, have to literally, you, you have to literally ask and say, um, hey, you know, they say, thanks for support. I, say, I still say, I said, don't thank me. If you liked your experience, tell five to 500 of your friends. And they say, oh, I will. And I can see the tweet come five minutes later where people tweet about it or blog about the, the, the customer experience. But they wouldn't have done it if I hadn't asked. Just having a like button on your page is not enough. You actually have to ask people, can you recommend us? Because once you've built the trust, they will. Um, measuring, um, I don't know how much time I'm, I'm at, but uh, we measure. Uh, we measure weekly uh, two things, and I put this at the end because at first, you don't really need the advanced funnels and everything when it's 10 people a week. You can just ask them directly, but when you start getting volume, the measurement makes sense. Uh, there's two really critical things that we measure through a funnel. Uh, we use Kissmetrics, I love it. Um, and uh, the, two, uh, the two big uh, funnels we measure are the sales funnel, which is they hit the site, you know, they register, they sign up for the free product, and they purchase and upgrade. Um, and then we measure the other one, which is really important and a lot of people miss, which is the, the first five-minute funnel. So they landed on the page. They signed up for an account. They signed up for one of our email uh, courses. They named a landing page. They added copy to a landing page. And I can see people drop off at each step. Um, and each step is important because that tells you where the holes are. And the people that actually go all the way through and publish a free page are way more likely to upgrade than the people who dropped off. So you can see where you start having problems. And every single one of those first impressions of the first five minutes forms their opinion for the rest of the, rest of the time. And I learned that I, was, uh, I worked at Microsoft and I was part of a usability study for Visual Studio. Some of you might know that product. Um, but uh, the, they did a usability study where all they did in the two different versions, they gave people a programming task and they made the startup time on one version 10 seconds longer than the startup time on the other. And then they asked them a series of questions about, uh, about the application performance people swore up and down. The only difference is startup time. People swore up and down. The editing experience was slower. It was slower to create a form. It was slower to build their project. Just swore up and down the whole experience for an hour of using the software after that first 10 seconds was horrific and way worse than the other version of the, of the product. There was no difference. And, and so that's why in this funnel, when you start thinking about your funnels, that those first, the first five seconds, the first 30 seconds, the first minute, I try and measure those things out for the first five minutes. And every time we've improved the first five minutes, there's been a, correlate, a correlating uh, increase in the percentage of customers that go from free and, and start paying us for the service. Um, that's my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, at Josh Lagard, blogs, kickofflabs.com, joshlagard.com, landingpages107.com, all sorts of places you can learn more. Just chat me up at the, the conference. I'm happy to share more tips. This was from an hour-long talk. I cut it down, and I think it was 12 minutes, but we'll see.